about a month after the explosion, uh, Oppenheimer comes to the White House and he sits down with Truman. And by this point, he's just racked with second thoughts. And he says, Mr. President, I, I, you know, I have these terrible regrets. I feel that I have blood on my hand. And Truman says, don't worry about it. I gave the order. I've got the blood on my hands. And they finish the conversation. Oppenheimer leaves. And Truman says to his staff, I never want to see that son of a bitch in this office ever again. That was Chris Wallace, June 2020, speaking to the Ronald Reagan Presidential Institute and discussing his book, Countdown 1945, The Extraordinary Story of the Atomic Bomb and the 116 Days That Changed the World. If you've seen the movie Oppenheimer, what Chris Wallace was talking about might sound familiar. It was October 25th, 1945, when Robert Oppenheimer met President Truman in the Oval Office. The scene was pivotal in the movie and in real life. Now it's time for the Academy Awards, and Oppenheimer is up for an Oscar for Best Picture, and in 12 other categories. So let's use this episode of C-SPAN's The Weekly to hear from experts and historians and biographers talking about that time Oppenheimer met Truman. The fact-check question for this podcast, did the movie get it right? First expert, Ray Monk, author of Robert Oppenheimer, A Life Inside the Center. Oppenheimer's views didn't change. Uh, he, Oppenheimer served on the target committee, actually, that chose the targets for uh, the uh, uh, atomic bomb, uh, and so was partially responsible for, for Hiroshima being one of the targets. Um, he, together with other people, persuaded them to drop Kyoto off the list because of its uh, uh, treasures of Buddhist architecture and its significance to Buddhism. But no, he was... Uh, he used the image of dirty hands. When he met President Truman after the bombings, uh, he said to Truman, Mr. President, I feel I have blood on my hands. And he did indeed have blood on his hands. He had the opportunity to support the Chicago um, uh, petition. The scientists at Chicago, led by Leo Szilard, drew up a petition signed by scientists urging the US government not to use this bomb in the first instance on Japanese civilians, but to invite the Japanese to a demonstration of its power, which they thought would be enough. Oppenheimer argued against that, and his argument against that was it might fizzle, fizzle. And if it fizzles, if it doesn't work, then, it's, um, then dem- the so-called demonstration has done more harm than good. Now, here's William Crawley of the University of Mary Washington. The story is that the scientist Robert Oppenheimer, who was, of course, influential, instrumental in, in developing the bomb, that, but I mean, he was like many of the scientists. They, they helped develop it, but then when it was actually used and the way it was used, they, they had second thoughts about it. Oppenheimer was one of those. And he called upon... Truman one day in the Oval Office and explained that the bomb having been used, he said, now we scientists, well, yeah, he said, I feel I have blood on my hands. Whereupon Truman took out his handkerchief and said, here, you want to wipe your hands off? And then after Oppenheimer left, Truman said to an associate, quote, I don't want to see that son of a bitch in this office ever again. Next, David Cassidy, author of J. Robert Oppenheimer and the American Century. When Oppenheimer then, after the war, when he expressed his guilt to Truman, that he even went into Truman's office and said he, his hands have blood on them, Truman said, get this guy out of here. I'm the one that decided who, to drop that bomb. He did not decide that. The story also was told by a scientist who worked on the Manhattan Project in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. That's where uranium was enriched for use in the atomic bomb. Here's Dear Turk Ruin. There's a story that J. Robert Oppenheimer walked into Truman's office and said to him, Mr. President, I have blood on my hands. And that's the last time Truman ever spoke to him. Now, let's hear the story told from President Truman's point of view. Here's Andrew Brown, author of The Neutron and the Bomb. Truman, of course, was the first world leader to have to experience the ambivalence of possessing nuclear weapons. And he's also the only one, fortunately so far, to live with the remorse of of using them. 
And I think there's no doubt that he did experience anguish from doing that, despite how much he may have denied it in later years. And that was, I think, encapsulated by the meeting he had with Oppenheimer in the Oval Office in October of 1945, when the highly strung physicist said to him, I feel as though I have blood on my hands. And Truman, ever the phlegmatic Midwesterner, said, no, the blood is on my hands, but said later to uh, Dean Asherson, I never want to see that son of a in this office again. Historian David McCullough won a Pulitzer Prize for his Truman biography. He, too, offered the president's perspective. When Oppenheimer was asked how many casualties he thought would result from the use of the bomb, he said perhaps as many as 20,000. Now, if you're the president and you know these terrible raids that you're sending against Japan are killing as much as twice or three times or even four times that, and that maybe the stunning effect of one plane delivering one bomb might shock the enemy into surrendering, and it wasn't a question of whether they would whether they were defeated. We knew they were defeated. They knew they were defeated. The question was whether they would surrender. And so the president made the decision. And the war ended. The Oppenheimer movie was based on the book American Prometheus, The Triumph and Tragedy of J. Robert Oppenheimer. The biography was published in 2005, and the authors were featured at the 2006 National Book Festival. Introducing their panel, here's Carlos Lozada, then with the Washington Post, now the New York Times. Welcome to the History and Biography Pavilion of the National Book Festival. My name is Carlos Lozada. I'm a deputy editor with the Outlook section at the Washington Post, which is a charter sponsor of the festival. And it is my sincere honor to introduce Kai Bird and Martin Sherwin, the authors of American Prometheus, The Triumph and Tragedy of J. Robert Oppenheimer. In the preface to the book, Uh, They capture their project and its title like this. Like that rebellious Greek god Prometheus, who stole fire from Zeus and bestowed it upon humankind, Oppenheimer gave us atomic fire. But then, when he tried to control it, when he sought to make us aware of its terrible dangers, the powers that be, like Zeus, rose up in anger to punish him. But American Prometheus is much more than a biography of the father of the atom bomb. Its scope and its ambition spans politics and science, culture, religion, and of course, war. The book is also the product of an unusual, but obviously very successful partnership. When Martin Sherwin began work on this book, he assured his editor that the project would take maybe five years, tops. That was 25 years ago. (laughs) So a couple of decades into the project, he was joined by co-author and friend Kai Bird, and then it took five years to complete. But obviously, it's been well worth the wait. Their book won the 2006 Pulitzer Prize and the 2006 National Book Credit Circle Award. (laughs) Both in the biography category. At the 2006 Book Festival, the authors did not discuss Dr. Oppenheimer's meeting with Harry Truman in the Oval Office, but Kai Bird did tell this story about Oppenheimer meeting the U.S. Senate. In the late 40s, I'm going to tell one more anecdote, and then we're going to hear Oppenheimer's voice. Uh, In the late 1940s, he was invited to an executive session of the U.S. Senate, and he was asked by a senator, this is about 1947, just two years after Hiroshima, Uh, would it be possible, Dr. Oppenheimer, for four or five men to construct a crude atomic device and put it in a suitcase or a crate and smuggle it aboard a ship into New York Harbor? And Oppenheimer said, yes, of course, that'd that'd be pretty easy. And the senator, kind of startled, said, well, what's our defense against this? Oppenheimer could be rather rudely witty at times, and he snapped back, well, sir, you could get a screwdriver and open up each crate and every suitcase and inspect it. I mean, there is no defense. Uh, After this testimony, the Atomic Energy Commission actually uh, commissioned a study of this problem. Uh, That report is still classified, but the physicists who wrote it in the scientific community refer to it today as the screwdriver report. A footnote, Kai Bird's co-author, Martin Sherwin, died in 2021. Finally, let's hear directly from the two men involved in that historic scene, President Truman and Dr. Oppenheimer. On August 6, 1945, the United States dropped the first atomic bomb on Hiroshima. 
That day, President Truman addressed the nation. He described the bomb as an alternative to a land invasion to defeat Japan. He talked about the destructive force of the new weapon and the secrecy surrounding its creation. And he praised the scientists who created the bomb, not naming, but presumably thinking of, Dr. Oppenheimer and his fellow physicists. We have spent more than $2 billion on the greatest scientific gamble in history, and we have won. But the greatest marvel is not the size of the enterprise, its secrecy, or its cost, but the achievement of scientific brains in making it work. And hardly less marvelous has been the capacity of industry to design the machines and methods to do things never done before. Both science and industry work together under the direction of the United States Army, which achieved a unique success in an amazingly short time. It is doubtful if such another combination could be got together in the world. What has been done is the greatest achievement of organized science in history. Now, here's Robert Oppenheimer. On November 16, 1945, at the University of Pennsylvania, Dr. Oppenheimer made his first public statement on the devastating weapon he created. With this speech, he began talking about the bomb in blunt terms. The pattern of the use of atomic weapons was set at Hiroshima. They are weapons of aggression, of surprise, and of terror. If they are ever used again, it may well be by the thousands, or perhaps by the tens of thousands. Their method of delivery may well be different and may reflect new possibilities of interception and new efforts to outwit them. And the strategy of their use may well be different than it was against an essentially defeated enemy. But it is a weapon for aggressors, and the elements of surprise and of terror are as intrinsic to it as are the fissionable nuclei. One of our colleagues, a man most deeply committed to the welfare and the growth of science, advised me not long ago not to give too much weight in any public words to the terrors of atomic weapons as they are and as they can be. He knows as well as any of us how much more terrible they can be made. It might, he said, cause a reaction hostile to science. It might turn people away from science. He is not such an old man, and I think it will make little difference to him or to any of us what is said now about atomic weapons. If before we die, we live to see a war in which they are used. I think that it will not help to avert such a war if we try to rub the edges off this new terror that we have helped bring to the world. And now, a bonus clip. Let's go back to Chris Wallace. When the veteran television news journalist appeared on C-SPAN's Q&A program in June 2020, he added this color about that dramatic and historic encounter between Dr. Oppenheimer and President Truman. You sort of know the story, but obviously when you begin, you don't know all the details, and as you begin to research it, you find out about about uh, scenes, characters, moments, events, details that uh, you know that you didn't know about that just make the story so much richer. And that if you had been a Hollywood screenwriter, you wouldn't ever have dared to write. Well, turns out Hollywood screenwriters did indeed write that scene, and they did it for a movie that's nominated for thirteen Academy Awards. That's it for this episode of C-SPAN's The Weekly. If you'll be watching the legendary Academy Awards to see how Oppenheimer does, here's something you can do during the commercial breaks. Search the C-SPAN video library. You'll find a lot more about Dr. Robert Oppenheimer and, of course, President Harry Truman. For now, thanks for listening and happy searching.